All right, so welcome everyone. Um, I think you know it's about time I'm going to get started. Uh, welcome to our first session. And uh, this session we have, um, well, five speakers, and I'm going to introduce all of them uh, one by one. Uh, but on this page, you can see their title of their talk. Uh, we'll keep every talk on time. Uh, but if the speaker and uh, and the talk a little bit earlier, so we probably will have time for a question. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to first of all introduce myself. So I'm going to be the session chair. My name is Lu Wang. I'm a professor um, in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Michigan. I'm also associate chair in the department. I received my PhD in biostatistics from Harvard in 2008. And since then I have been always in Michigan. Um, I actually also graduated from Beijing University, Peking University. So many of you probably are my alumni. Um, so then uh, I want to mention that, you know, I will be the last speaker and today we'll have the other four speakers in front of me. And all of our topics are related to precision medicine or causal inference and in that area. So our first speaker is Tom Jiang. He is from University of Montreal. He is a postdoc right now and he received his PhD from University of Waterloo. I met him from one of our conference about causal inference last year, actually earlier this year, but when we uh, organized the sessions is from last year. And he has very interesting work in the field of causal inference. And specifically, he's deeply engaged in the development of methodologies related to dynamic tremor genes and also the practical applications of DTR, dynamic tumor regimes in the real world. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let Tone to start his talk. Uh, thanks Lou and organizer for uh, invitation for this talk. I'm very happy to present my work that has been done recently uh, in the context of the vaccine effectiveness estimation under the test negative design. Okay. Um, so the context is the infectious disease, epidemics or pandemics or seasonal influenza. Uh, the public health data on the infections are collected from the individuals obtaining the test. So it could be the test during the pandemics. Um, with a lot of information can be obtained. For example, the PCR test for the SARS-CoV-2 infections. So it could be the test for each individual's uh, and then we have the result or the outcomes, which is either positive or negative for the SARS-CoV-2 infections. Uh, but the, for the non-pandemic context, we also have this kind of data. Uh, for example, people to go to see their primary care physicians and then get the test. So the test is, uh, so for the latter, the test is almost completely driven by the care seeking when ill, but for the uh, first, for the, uh, for the first uh, pandemic uh, context, the test is going to be diverse reasons depend on the public health reason for the getting the test. So clinical trials was, was designed to establish the efficacy of the vaccine. So once the vaccine is ruled out, the jurisdictions may diverge from the test protocols. For example, here in Canada, there is a huge gap between the first doses and the second doses. And the vaccine is used on the broader populations than the clinical trials. So the, there is a demand for the observational analysis to establish the vaccine effectiveness in the real world, uh, heterogeneous populations and the usage for the long-term periods, but the clinical trials cannot evaluate, evaluate it. So the test and negative design, that's the observational study design that compared the outcomes in the people who had the symptoms, characteristics of the infectious disease of interest and then get the test. The goal is to estimate the vaccine effectiveness. So uh, it was originally proposed to study the vaccine effectiveness against the laboratory confirmed or medical attendant influenza in Canada and then it gradually formalized by a lot of researchers. Uh, now it can be used to evaluate the COVID vaccine effectiveness. 
So here is the causal diagram that we rely on, and I will use, I will use it to illustrate the data structure and study design. For example, uh, each of us have the vaccine status, uh, vaccinated or unvaccinated for simplicity. Then we have some infections status, which is latent. Uh, we could have some non-infections or the SARS-CoV-2 infections. That's the target infections we are interested in, and some other infections. Then we probably have some symptoms like COVID-19-like symptoms, and then we get the test. Here is the version for the hospitalization, we get the test. So for the covariance that affects the both exposure and the, all the components of the outcomes, uh, there are three components for the outcomes. It's uh, infections, symptoms, and hospitalization. So for the unmarried variable, it only affects the components of outcomes, but does not affect the exposure V here. That's the conditional exchangeability that we rely on. So for the box around the W and H, that's because the design does. The TND design selects the people who has the symptoms and who are hospitalized. So each individual in the TND samples has some symptoms and is hospitalized but some of them has the SARS-CoV-2 infections, and some of them have other infections. So this is the notations for the data. So for the complete data, that's the Z superscript C here, we have the covariance vaccine, uh, infections, and the symptoms and hospitalization. This is under the probability P in terms of the simple random samples. And we did define S, that's the presence of the inclusion criteria for the TND design. Uh, and S, uh, S is the indicator for the I is not, not equal zero, I is infectious. Zero means the non-infectious, I equal one is the other infectious, and I equal two is the SARS-CoV-2 infectious. And then it has symptoms and hospitalization. So for the observed data, there's a CVI for the indicator S equal one. It's under the distribution of the P as a Z given the S equal one selection equal one, or under the TND distribution here. It is the bias distribution due to the outcome dependent samples. So for the outcome here, that's the, as I said, that's the component of the three, uh, three indicators. The first, the, the I equal two, that's the SARS-CoV-2 infections and symptoms and hospitalization. So keep in mind that this outcome is not usual in the literature. So the typical analytical method is the logistic regression. It requests the outcome on the vaccine status and the merit covariance. And for the test, those who are tested positive are the cases, and those who test the negative are the controls. And the beta here is the coefficient of vaccine status. So on the two assumptions, the first one is the modeling assumptions for the logistic regression. The second one we call the control exchangeability. That is a conditional independent assumption. So vaccine is conditionally independent of the, some other infections. Then the R ratio identifies the risk ratio of the association between the vaccination and the probability of the hospitalized symptomatic infections. So unlike the case control studies, we don't require the real disease assumption, but we need the second control exchangeability assumptions. Then the R ratio identifies the risk ratio. Then the vaccine effectiveness is defined as one month exponential beta here. So the logistic regression targets the risk ratio, which is collapsible, and we can directly estimate the marginal risk ratio under the probability P. That's the probability of the having the outcome of interest and condition on the covariance and the vaccine status V versus another vaccine status V zero, and then it marginalized over the covariance C here. And the vaccine effectiveness is one minus the marginal risk ratio. So under the standard causal inference uh, identifiability assumptions, this marginal risk ratio equals the causal risk ratio. And the Schnitzer, she proves the, uh, she gives IPW estimator. So the main result is in this equation here, right hand side is the marginal expectation of the outcome conditional on the vaccine state of V, left hand side is expectation under the TND distribution. 
Here you can see the propensity score P is under the simple random samples. So the question is how to use the TND data to estimate this propensity score. So we also rely on the con control exchangeability assumption. Formally, that's the condition on the covariance that the vaccine is independent of the being hospitalized for the symptoms of the other infections. We call that I equal one is other infections. Then we have the following result that's identity that. That means the propensity score can be estimated only by the controls on the TND distribution. That's uh, Mireille uh, Schnitzer's the result about IPW estimator. Build on this result, and we give the alternative identifiability formula using the debiasing width. First, we define the debiasing width, omega V of C here. That's the ratio of the selection probabilities. So for the numerator, that's the selection probability conditional on the vaccine status V and the covariance C. For the denominator, the only condition on the C. Then given the conditional TND expectation of the outcome, the mu V of the C here, then the marginal expectation of the outcome can be written as the equation one here. So for the right-hand side, that's the TND expectation on, uh, and in terms of the outcome model mu V and the debiasing width omega V here. So we show that under the control exchangeability, the debiasing width are identifiable in the following two ways. The first way here, this is the ratio of the propensity score. For the numerator, that's the propensity score estimated by the whole TND data as equal one here. But for the denominator, that's the propensity score estimated only by the control. For the second way, that's the ratio of the outcome probabilities. So for the numerator, that's outcome probability condition on the covariance C. For the denominator, that also condition on the vaccine status V here. Then we give the outcome regression best estimator in terms of the outcome model mu and debiasing width. If the debiasing width is identified in the second way, that's the ratio of the outcome modeling, then the whole outcome regression best estimator only depend on the outcome model. That's the two single robust estimator. And the following part, I will show our uh, main result. And we use the non-parametric theory to construct an efficient estimator. Uh, we can, this method can uh, use the machine learning method and still maintain the valid statistical inference. So we call our methods to estimate vaccine effectiveness on the TND or the tender, the TND W robust. We use the, it use the sample splitting and the machine learning method. So first we derive the efficient influence function. We target the marginal expectation of outcome the psi v here under the vaccine status v, and the efficient influence function is in this expression. So the, the whole deriving process is, is dependent on the probability p. But for the indicators here, the indicator y equal one and indicators y equal zero and s equal one, we are constrained the simple random samples to the TND samples if the efficient influence function best estimator is considered. So there are two components in this efficient influence function. So for the first component, the numerator is the indicator of y equal one is only related to the cases. But for the denominator, that's the propensity score estimated only by the controls. And for the second component, that's the indicator y equal one, y equal zero and s equal one is only related to the controls. And in terms of the debiasing width, outcome model from the denominator, denominator that's the product of the propensity score and the marginal uh, expectation of outcome. That's the M model here. That's the probability of Y equals zero condition on the covariance C. And then based on this, we give the estimate of the psi V. That's the PN of the function phi V here. PN is the empirical mean and the phi V is in this form. You can tell that it's directly uh, directly derived from the efficient influence function. It's also called the one-step estimator. And we further explore the distributional Taylor expansions for the psi v, and uh, we uh, summarize the result in this theorem. 
So under some assumptions and the conditions, that the psi v hat satisfies the equation two here. So the equation two tell us that the psi v hat, the difference between the psi v hat and the true psi v can decompose, de decomposed by the three terms. So for the last term, it's small op one over root n, which is asymptotically negligible. It is derived from the empirical process term. So to guarantee this empirical process term to be negligible, the two conditions are required. So for the first condition, we constrain the complicity for this by v function. The second condition is to use the data splitting. Then the empirical process is uh, one, small p one over root n, which is negligible. For the first term, that's the second order remaining term. And we show that this the second order remaining term is bounded by the sum of the four new nuisance uh, errors in terms of the uh, propensity score model, outcome model, and device invest, and the marginal outcome model, M model here. And finally, for the middle term, that's the Pn minus the P here of the efficient inflow function. This is a sample average of the uh, fixed function. Now we can apply the central limit theorem to get the limiting distribution for the sign we had. So if the second order term, uh, second order remaining term is negligible, that is of the order small p1 over root n, then the equation three satisfies. That is, the psi v hat is real n consistent and asymptotic normal. So the following question is, on what conditions does the second order term become negligible? So is it possible for you to full screen your slide? Some audience request that, and you okay. can control L. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by the way, you have about eight minutes left. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the first is about the rule inconsistent and symptotic normal. So uh, we give the three conditions uh, about the converged rate for the nuisance function. So the first one is the uh, quarter rate for the propensity score, and two and three is the, for the outcome model, also quarter rate. So we show that under the assumption one, two, three, then the second order term is negligible. So the side we had is rule and consistent and symptotic normal. The limiting distribution, normal distribution with mean zero and variance is the variance of the efficient inflow function. So the tech home note here is to, we can use the machine learning method to estimate the nuisance function at the, uh, uh, at the quarter rate. Uh, to obtain the root and red for our estimate. Uh, secondly, we show the double robustness. So we show that either the propensity score model is correctly specified and our outcome model are correctly specified. Then the second order remainder term will converge to the zero in probability and side v hat is consistent. So correctly specifying the propensity score model or, and all outcome model resulting in the limiting uh, resulting eliminate the second order remainder term. Uh, so based on this result, we give, give the three-step algorithm called tender. And the first step, the sample splitting. Second step, we use the cross-fitting and machine learning method to estimate the nuisance function. And third step, we construct uh, the vaccine effective estimator, best this efficient estimate side we have here. So th this is the uh, uh, simulations, and we have three goals. The first is conduct uh, sample splitting and machine learning method to assess the efficiency of the tender. The second goal is to investigate the double robustness of the tender. The third goal is to verify the coverage rate of the 95 percentage confidence intervals based on the efficient inference function. And we generate the data based on the, uh, the DAG here. Uh, we select the individuals who has the symptoms and who are hospitalized. So in the study one, we use the highly adapted lasso, which usually can achieve the quarter rate for the nuisance function. And this is the result for the 2000 sample size. For the beta EM here, that's a coefficient for the modification represents the heterogeneity treatment effect of the vaccine. And we compare with IPW and uh, outcome regression and our tender has smaller bias and more color, smaller monocolor stand errors can also achieve the 95 percentage coverage rate. 
And the second study, we show the double robustness. We particularly have the four scenarios, the both propensity score model and the outcome model are correctly specified. B and C, the one of them correctly specified, and D, now neither of them correctly specified. And compared with the scenario of D, the first the three, the efficient influence best function of the smaller close to zero bias. And for particularly for the first the scenario, the efficient influence function estimate can achieve the 95 percentage coverage. So finally, I will show you some uh, real data analysis. Uh, this data is the administrative data set of the healthcare workers in Quebec. So this study covers the time frames characterized by the Omicron BA.5 dominance period from the July 3rd to the November 5th. So outcomes is the individuals who have the symptoms and the who are hospitalized. And Y equal one are tested positive and Y equal zero are tested negative. So for the vaccine here, V equal zero is those who receive the booster vaccine within the six months. So boost the third dose, fourth dose, and fifth dose. And V equals zero are those who receive the final dose, the six plus months. So for the covariance, the age, gender, multimorbidity, and the epidemiological observation, observational time frame. So here is the result. We have the result from four models. IPW, outcome regression, and proposed tender and for the logistic regression. Here is the marginal risk ratio, and we use the generalized linear model and also the machine learning best method called the MAS, the multivariate adaptive regression splines. So the, for the generalized linear model, IPW and outcome regression and logistic regression, they give the same point estimator, but our tender slide gives the slightly smaller web point estimate. So for the machine learning best estimator, uh, we have the smaller uh, values compared with the generalized linear models. So the conclusion here is to against the hospitalized symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection <laughs> compared with the booster, uh, so, so the generalized uh, linear model. Uh, so what that means is, is that Five percentage um, and the mass is thirty-five percent. Four percent. Even though, um, because and this is the first. Yeah, could you, yeah. For the discussion is uh, our efficient influence function is extreme to the uh, propensity score model and the uh, outcome probabilities. Recall that that's the denominator for the efficient influence function. And to address the um, merit confounding and client stratification bias due to the healthcare seeking behavior, and Lee, uh, they took the double negative control approach. And for the uh, current project, I'm focusing on the uh, estimate the CAT, the conditional, conditional energy treatment effect. We try to develop the optimal treatment allocation strategy in terms of the uh, limited vaccine and also consider interference. Uh, we want to thank the support from the Canadian Institute for the Health Research, and that ends my presentation, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Tom, for this excellent talk. Any questions? Obviously, the talk is very well delivered. I also think this is very clear. I just had a, a one clarification question about your data. So it seems that your, your data, they don't have like two stage of treatment. So you only consider one stage treatment, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Got you. Uh, Henry, you have a question? Yeah. I also have a quick question about the method, um, theory part. Uh, so I realized for the pie, you have small O order, while for the rest of the nonsense parameter, you require big O. Can you briefly explain why there's a um, a difference between these two? Okay, yeah, because um, we want the finally small OP1 over rule N. The, it depends on the second order remainder term here. You can see that each term has the pi model here. For example, the first term, second, third. So if we just constrain the uh, propensity score model, small OP, the time the big OP is also small OP. So we particularly require the, that stronger uh, converge rate for the propensity score model. 
and the, the, for the big O is just the bonded uh, the kind of the, the loser, I mean, the relaxed assumption, yeah. I see, that makes sense, since they are shared uh, component, yeah. Thank exactly. you. Yeah. Other questions? All right, so let's thank our speaker, Tong, again. Thank you.